This will be um, the sixth lecture series for Research Methods course. I'm going to be talking here about um, two methods of collecting data, interviews and focus group, and also how the language used in these, um, collected in part of these interviews and focus groups can then be coded. So the first section of the lecture will focus on uh, various forms of interviews, basically semi-structured interviews. You'll sometimes hear these called elite interviews because you might conduct them with like say politicians or other members, um, executives, etc. But in some ways they're going to be like surveys, but in some ways you'll see they're somewhat different. So um, if we want to think about what an interview is in general, it's uh, usually going to be some sort of a, um, a verbal conversation, often in person, but it could be conducted say over the phone um, or you know Skype or some other form of verbal communication where you're asking people about either events or experiences or some aspect of knowledge and you're uh, listening um, not you know not like a closed form question but actually hearing the person's words and that's why the sort of words that they use or the text is such an important part of the interviewing process um, uh, while it's true that in general we can think about these interview questions as being either semi-structured, which means that there's some underlying structure to the interview, or completely unstructured, just like a normal conversation between friends, generally speaking, it's good before you go and conduct an interview to have some sense of at least the topics and the structure of the conversation we're going to um, follow. Uh, one form of an interview, we typically call interviews something that are conducted conducted person to person, but in theory, right, you could also have multiple people, and those are usually called focus groups. So if you have, in essence, seven or eight people participating in a conversation. Um, interviews can be conducted as the main study. Um, uh, you have to be very careful. Again, there are sort of limits to the types of inferences one can make purely from interview data. But sometimes they can be a very useful addendum in terms of triangulation at, say, getting more in-depth information um, that to, say, uh, uh, a, um, a more structured set of surveys that is available to a wider group, or sometimes in terms of, say, data generation, um, help assisting with measurement, it's um, hypothesis generation, etc. So when are some of the good times to conduct interviews? Um, often, particularly in an area where there's not a lot known about a particular topic, um, or where uh, one is trying to get to know a particular area, say if you're doing a more in-depth area study, um, you might want to talk about interviews very early um, as part of the exploratory research stages. Um, they're also incredibly useful to use when dealing with sensitive or elite or difficult to reach populations. So you can't really, you know, administer surveys to, to young children, but you could conduct some sort of interview with them. And in particular, it's nice to have, you can have in essence, um, uh, guardians uh, present. Um, when you're dealing with politicians or executives or other members of sort of um, some sort of elite, again, you're pretty limited um, in your ability to just send out a survey, but you can sometimes set up conversations. Um, it's often the case when you're doing also working with uh, sort of um, difficult to reach populations like criminals or um, uh, homeless people, again, these are all situations where interviews might be more useful than um, other forms of data collection. Um, when, often, particularly whenever you're talking about certain topics, it can be more personal interactions can actually yield better data. Um, also, if your interviewee's reading and writing skills are limited, so if you are dealing um, with uh, non-literate populations, you know, a lot of cases in anthropology or ethnography, you might want to be dealing with interviews. Um, and just in general, whenever you want to go more in depth to really explore different avenues of a, of a topic in that interactive way. So the idea of a semi-structured interview, you can think about this um, as a, sort of, again, our, our sort of our Sherlock Holmes approach to these is that one has in mind a set of topics that one wants to cover and a set of questions that one wants to answer that you think can sort of help confirm or deny certain hypotheses um, or help yield information about how best to measure um, a particular construct or um, uh, other, other forms. Uh, so what you'll typically have with these interviews is you'll have a set of questions or topics that you want to cover and sometimes some potential question prompts or follow-up questions. Um, sometimes it can actually be useful to think ahead and prepare like 
okay, if uh, you're going to be asking people about candidates about all the different mobilization methods they're going to be using, then maybe you want to have like a checklist of ones that they mention and have sort of another category. Again, not that you're not also listening for other information, but that just becomes an easier way to record the information based on you know that's a question you want to ask at some point. Um, you might also uh, realize that in the case of the interview, they might mention something, say they mention, oh, they, um, you have one question about what techniques of mobilization they used, you have another question about, say, who they helped get mobilize, but they start talking about the people whenever you ask them about techniques, so you need to be able to switch streams and record that information um, uh, clearly. Another idea is that sometimes you might actually have a short closed form survey, perhaps that you provide to them before the interview to help them know a little bit about what it's about, or sometimes you might want to give it to them afterwards. Again, you want to be very careful because there are not all populations will want to use that, but it can be sometimes a useful addendum. Um, and uh, if, if you think about the idea that even most closed form situation, surveys can often be conducted face to face, it's fairly easy again to have um, that as part of your semi-structured interview. So a purely unstructured interview means you go in with really no preconceptions. Um, and the interviewee is going to have a lot of great uh, influence over what topics get covered. So sometimes you're just very interested in a, an interesting phenomena. Um, and uh, you really want an expert to sort of tell you about it to help you generate hypotheses and tell you about the research design. Um, so whistleblowing in organizations, one might go in with very little sense of what it is and therefore um, it can be quite useful. Uh, uh, understanding crime and criminals, <laughs> um, it's often the case you don't want to go in even if in the back of your mind you have a set of topics. You want to be very, very careful about um, uh, how deeply you probe. Um, and so it might be better to live in a much more, in essence, a, sometimes it would be called a participant observation, where you sort of go and you sort of live with the people and get to know them instead of having a bunch of, you know, a one or two hour unstructured, um, I mean, unstructured, semi structured interview. Um, now, one thing is, if, you, if one thinks about it, it's if you want to think about things like generalizability or the ability to draw inferences. Um, these become somewhat limited, obviously, when you're only able to conduct a short number of interviews, but sampling is still an important um, aspect of the interviewing process. So part of it could be, what is the sampling frame? So what types of claims do you want to make on the basis of the data you collect? So if you want to talk um, about, say, the, the, the language that candidates use when discussing political phenomena, and whether or not it varies across Democrats and Republicans, you might have to have sort of an even number of Democrats and Republicans that otherwise might be the same, for example, right? Um, but sometimes what you're interested in is, say, the views of elite activists within environmental organizations. And so then you might want to use something called a snowball technique, um, where you, in essence, start with a few well-known activists and you ask them to name, name other people who they find influential or who they think are influential in the department. So you, in essence, start with a sort of core group of people and then you keep going out different layers, asking each person like um, who they think is influential until you aren't getting generating any new names. That's called snowball sampling. Um, there are other, so stratified sampling would basically be what I was saying before with Democrats and Republicans, where you sort of, you have different groups you want to sort of sample from, and so you just choose some from each, each group to represent. Um, there also could be theoretical sampling, in essence, where you say, okay, I'm really interested in understanding more about this particular phenomenon that's occurring in this country. So, uh, you, you in essence, you're driven by, um, in essence, this country deviates in all ways from what we would expect the theory to be, so I'm going to go learn more about it. And so you then go interview people from that country because there's something unique about that country um, because it actually contradicts what you would think theoretically. You have to think a little bit about how many and whether you're going to interview them in groups versus individuals and what the underlying dynamic is. Again, it'll often be the case you want to interview individuals, but if you're more interested in the dynamics of group interaction, as we'll talk about in a minute, um, groups can also be useful. Um, thinking about uh, saturation techniques in general, basically making sure, how do you make sure that you've covered all the topics you might want to cover? Um, uh, again, one caveat here is that you want to be very careful about um, wearing your interviewee out or about going, uh, you know, going too much into details until they're just sort of telling you um, the same thing over and over again. Um, 
and also the standardization uh, to what degree do you want there to be some standardization in both who you're choosing in the interview itself um, because maybe you're interested in um, comparing groups but maybe you're interested more in variation within a group maybe you're interested in some sort of emerging or interesting topic so again these are different ways of thinking about sampling so again we often want to have something like an interview a guide um, which our interview guides can be incredibly useful um, if you've ever been through one of these interviews in helping the interviewer stay focused, maintain consistency and suitability of questions. Um, it can be very difficult to, even if you think you know before you've gone into an interview and you're going to sit there for an hour, an hour and a half with the same person asking questions. If you haven't sort of got some way of keeping track which topics you wanted to cover, it's easy to forget things about them growing up because you're, you, you can, the interviewee basically has a lot of ability to sort of take you off the course. So again, another reason to have these interview guide. Um, and think about the interview guide, you want to be as non-biased and non-threatening um, as possible, right? So you don't want to say, well, why did you make that stupid decision, counselor? You might want to think again about how you say things in a way that, um, in essence, people feel like they can sort of open up um, to you. Uh, one of the interesting things about, um, especially with elite interviews, is that um, it often helps if you send, say, a young female in to do a lot of the interviews. People feel much more comfortable and relaxed and not so much as on guard with a less threatening uh, person. Um, we, we know this to be the case in, in large social surveys, but it can also help in, in more elite interview settings. Um, to the extent that you want to also, in many ways, um, present yourself to be a person who understands or sort of can do that again you get people to open up a bit more not necessarily reporting true attitudes as we know but there can be some opening up um, you might uh, in all interviews we have to think about getting uh, consent um, obviously with public figures it's a little bit different they don't have to technically provide consent as we should know from ethics reviews but you might want to at least have some sense of after the interview to leave some information uh, to give them a chance to get in touch with you to give a comment sheet um, and also, you need some sort of, in essence, what we tend to call a face sheet or an introduction letter, where before you sit down, you provide them some information about yourself, too. Again, these are sort of common courtesies, but the interview guide um, or the interview sort of um, materials will not just include your initial uh, or your sort of way that you're recording your interview questions, but might also include both your sort of internal, in, initial introductory letter, face sheet, slash consent sheet if you need it. Um, and also some sort of post-interview um, uh, communication of your information and, and uh, solicitation of comments. Now, when you're setting up an interview guide, one of the most difficult decisions to make, and I will say having done some of this and advise students on this, is that it's almost impossible to know the right way to structure the questions, right? So when you sit down and you think about, do you have just a list of topics? Do you try to ask people chronologically to sort of describe something that happened to them? Um, how do you make sure whenever people, in essence, what you'll often find is that pe as people launch into stories, they'll start with their story answering questions that are later or earlier <laughs> in your list. And so how do you sort of cross check and make sure they've given you the complete answer um, in some way? Uh, it can be difficult to, to think about. Um, even coming up with the questions, one often has to basically reverse engineer um, what it should be. So I tend to think um, when you're dealing with interviews and you're thinking part of what you're going to be using is the text, whether in the form of co quotes or text analysis. Uh, one has to think, well, what types of claims will I be making, <laughs> potentially, um, that these interview quotes are going to be most useful for? What types of questions will I need to answer? What types of evidence? So if you think about these as we're going to be giving, making a claim and these are evidence to support our claim, we need to be thinking about what types of claims we want to make, and that can help you figure out which questions to ask. And, and sometimes even the logic and the flow of how they um, do that. Uh, and think about how structured you want the questions to be. If you have too much micromanagement um, of the questions, uh, maybe you don't allow for enough conversation. If you have too broad a questions, you can't always go in depth into each one. If each of your questions, if you have only a few questions, you can go in more in depth, but maybe you don't cover all the breadth of the area you want. Um, sometimes also, you might want to simply be searching for more emergent themes that people end up asking about and you might want to even follow up on a few of the, the themes so you know you have to be paying attention when somebody says something you might be like wait a minute hold on what did you just say can you tell me more about what you meant if something is somewhat surprising so uh, if you're too structured and you aren't attending enough to thinking 
I'm looking for some of these other things, it can actually lead you a bit astray. So here are some examples of the types of prompts one might issue and follow-ups. Um, so one might be to sort of invite a description. Could you tell me more about how you campaign in local neighborhoods? Um, you might want to try to elicit some context. Um, so when did you first get interested in politics? And then sort of think, well, okay, but were you considering running for office at the time? Did somebody maybe ask you? Um, if you're, you've got some questions about, did anyone ever recruit you? Well, you know, tell me more about this person. How did you know them, right? So you might want to have some of these additional questions to follow up. Um, also, you can ask sort of hypothetical type questions. So what would you think if such and such happened? Or what would you think if a policy happened? Would you agree with this or not? So you can sort of use little vignettes um, to test out how people might say at least that they're going to respond. Subject, of course, to the caveat that what they say and what they might actually do in that situation aren't always the same thing. It at least gives you some sense of what they might say they would do in that situation. Um, super important, of course, especially because, again, we're going to be focusing not just on note taking, but on the actual um, the language of the interview itself. Being sure to ask for consent to tape the interview. Um, now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't take notes during the interview, which is incredibly invaluable if the recording device should fail. But especially with uh, you know iPhones, et cetera, today, there's a great one, just press record um, an app that you can use. And the nice thing about it is not only does it sort of automatically record, but it actually produces an automated transcript. Um, in the old days, you had to pay people a lot to transcribe. Now you can actually have Google sort of auto transcribe um, on your iPhone. And while it makes some mistakes, you can probably get at least 80% uh, or so um, right. Now, that said, there are also going to be things that don't come out in the language. You might see gestures, you might see pauses, other sort of nonverbal cues that tell you when someone is really thinking, like something that's difficult to talk about versus not difficult to talk about. Um, one can also have a case, in some cases, where people say, this is off the record, and then you have to actually stop. You know, you have to press not record, and you have to be... Um, uh, um, because uh, you have to press or not record and you have to stop taking notes. Um, I didn't actually know that the first time I did these type of interviews and I was confused because I wasn't a journalist. So of course I had to take notes on everything. But even with academic research, uh, one needs to, to sort of abide somewhat by the, the off the record. Um, but part of it again is that you want to be thinking about recording these observations and thoughts immediately after the interview while things are fresh on your mind. Not that you don't want to go back to it and analyze it afterwards, but you want to sort of have the full you want to get the, the depth and the richness of the interview by recording as much as possible at the time. Um, then, of course, you start putting the puzzle back together as we actually start figuring out how we're going to work with all this data we have collected. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example um, also on the right here of how something like this is written up in an actual article. If you want to know more about what they did with these data, you can go and look up the article that is referenced um, to find out more about how these interviews are being used with different informants.